the title is a little misleading because it says uh, covering the craziest case uh, without going crazy yourself. So you've got to be a little crazy to be in the newspaper business anyway, maybe a lot crazy. Um, but you get to meet the nicest people and the worst people on the face of the earth. And so, um, and you run into, like Daryl says, uh, naked people saying it's not as bad as it looks and all that kind of crazy stuff. Um, this story, I've covered thousands and thousands of stories, uh, written, I don't know how many, how many stories. But this one stood out from the beginning. The first time I wrote out, um, getting ready to write out vampire cult killers, teen vampire cult murders, my hands literally stopped over the keyboard for a second. Because I'm thinking like, is this for real? And it, it was for real. And um, you know, I learned then, you never say, I think I've seen it all. <laughs> Especially in Florida. But <laughs> there's everything you can imagine. But this case was just, just terrible. And fascinating, though, because um, I wrote at one time, I says, I wanted to cover the case because I wanted to see the depth of depravity. And this is it. Um, so here's what happened. Um, November, oh, I'm going to read to you a couple of pages. Um, it says, Jennifer Windor slipped into her home on cat paws at 10.35 p.m. November 25th, 1996. Quote, I was late. I was supposed to be home by 10.15. So I just kind of walked past the couch with my head down and just looked at the floor, she told the detective. I could hear that the TV was on and I could see my dad's feet on the couch, you know, laying on the couch. But daddy always fell asleep I just figured he was sleeping and I could sneak by. So I just snuck back into my room and went into my room to use the, my telephone. My phone cord had been ripped out of the wall. That was odd, she thought, but her sister Heather had been on a rampage lately, so she figured she probably destroyed it in a fit of anger. She walked into Heather's room to use her phone to call her boyfriend to let her know that she got home safely. I was going to the kitchen because I was going to get something to eat because I was hungry and I saw a blood trail by the breakfast nook almost in the living room and on the way to the kitchen and then I saw a blood spot on the kitchen floor and that's when I saw my mom. She was laying there and then I ran to the living room to see he wasn't asleep. He had already been attacked. She ran back and called 911. My parents have been killed. Please send ambulances. How do you know they've been killed, the operator asked. There's blood everywhere. Please, as fast as you can. Asked if she was alone, she replied, my sister is gone. She should be here. She's only 15 and she's gone. So this is outside of Eustis by uh, Black Bear Country Club on 44 in that area. It's a nice quiet neighborhood, five acre lot, nice brick house, swimming pool, uh, fences. Um, you know, the last thing you would expect to see in this area. Inside, the carnage was awful. There was, there literally was blood everywhere. The people had been attacked with a crowbar, um, had been pummeled with a crowbar. So um, even the veteran police officers were just like aghast. So she, they, a 911 operator kept her on the phone until um, the deputy got there. And then she came outside and then she was able to fall to pieces. So um, 
they ask her. Now, Jennifer is 17 years old. She's a pretty uh, Eustace High School cheerleader, um, senior. She says, uh, well, who could have done this? And right away, she says, my sister, Heather. So, um, because the police, when they first get there, they, they don't know if Heather's been, and they still don't know at this point, had she been abducted, had she been murdered, had she been part of this or what, what was going on? But she says, my sister, because she was acting, she had been arguing with her parents for some time, and one night she said the weirdest thing at bedtime, she says, Jen, have you ever plotted mom and dad's death? So um, that's why. And that wasn't the only reason why, because um, her friend, Rod Farrell, they'd been classmates at Eustis High School until he moved back to Kentucky. So um, his, he was a, a complete whack job. Uh, he told people, he told it, um, Heather, that uh, he, he could have somebody killed if, if uh, somebody was giving Jennifer a hard time, that kind of thing. So, uh, and she says, well, I know my sister is um, into vampire stuff, you know, her room's got all these gargoyles and all these crazy drawings and all that. Heather was an artistic girl, but she dressed like an artiste. She was, uh, she had, and this is 1996, she wore fishnet stockings, dyed her hair all kinds of weird colors. Um, you know, she didn't have piercings because her parents wouldn't allow that or tattoos, but she um, had all kinds of crazy clothes. And one of her friends uh, described her outfits as practically obscene. So um, she was very artiste. And Rod Farrell was an artist too. And he had a vivid imagination. But what he did, he drew pictures of monsters and so on. Well, so right away, um, one of the first people on the scene was Bill Gross. Bill Gross was an assistant state attorney in Lake County then. He was in charge of all homicides. So Bill liked to get out there and go to the scene to make sure the police didn't uh, mess up the evidence or anything. And um, so he's out there and they're looking for evidence and they're out there at this house for hours and hours. But he gets, um, while, the, while the police are out there, the deputies, um, there's a visitor that comes up to the Windorf home and her name is Suzanne LeClaire. And Suzanne says, she was, saw all these detectives, all these patrol cars, says, what's going on? And uh, she says she had a message for the Windors that the girls, meaning her daughter, uh, uh, Janine, and uh, Heather were going to run away with Rod Farrell. Rod Farrell had come back into town, they were gonna run away. Well, uh, Janine, Mr. Ride, thank God for her. So um, that was a big plus. And then, so Bill Gross gets there, Rod and three other teenagers from Kentucky, Murray, Kentucky, had um, stopped at a girl's house in Pine Lakes named Shannon Yoey. And um, they said, okay, and they're, Bill and this detective are talking to this girl and they describe the car they came in. It's kind of a beater, you know, Buick small car. It was uh, not running well and so on. And um, so they're about ready to leave. And just as they're ready to leave, um, this girl says, oh, and by the way, they were drinking each other's blood. So um, he says, Bill looks at the detective and goes, oh, okay, say what now? So, so we got a different kind of case altogether. So, and Shannon later uh, will say uh, what else they had to say, some very odd things. So, and they came back. This was on a Sunday 
that they arrived at her house the first time and they came back on Monday, um, the day of the murders, shortly before the murders. So this is the setup. So um, the more they find out about Rod, the worse it got. Um, there was, um, they call the sheriff in uh, um, Murray, Kentucky, and he says, you've got a wild bunch on the loose up there. This group was suspected of a, a horrific um, animal abuse case at a, at a shelter, at an animal shelter, and a ritualistic trampling down um, grass in a circle and just, just horrible stuff. And uh, right before Rod left home, um, they caught him um, uh, building gasoline bombs and um, uh, doing some other things. And he had in his room, he had painted his room all black and uh, had an altar on there with a skull and some other stuff. All this occult stuff, constantly. So um, this is what they were finding out. So this is Monday, Monday, early Tuesday. So, um, so then, about three days later, um, bef well, before three days later, they get caught three days later. But before um, they get caught, obviously, this is a huge story, not just in Lake County, but it made international news everywhere. I mean, the British papers were picking it up. Um, when the trial came two, to, two years later, uh, we had a German TV crew come from Miami. I mean, it just went everywhere. Um, and it's, it just got crazier and crazier and crazier the more you found out. This is one of those rare cases. Now, this is back in the day when the Sentinel had a bureau in Tiberias. They don't have one now. We had a bunch of people, and they sent people all over the country to talk to uh, witnesses and family members and all this stuff. And um, so it was a very different time. We were pouncing on every single piece of paper, every hearing, every press release, everything. And, uh, and we had to fight for everything because the lawyers were freaking out um, they were, the defense attorneys were um, freaking out because they, they just knew that they would have a, all this pretrial publicity that would be bad for their clients and they'd have to have a change of venue and all that sort of thing, which is a legitimate concern on their part. But it got really crazy. Everything about this case was crazy. There wasn't anything about it. It wasn't crazy. Um, so... They caught these kids in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, three days later. Thanksgiving Day, they were broke, about out of gas, uh, had no money, they were hungry, uh, dirty. Um, so they arrested them. Uh, one of the girls had, uh, Rod's girlfriend had called um, her mother, uh, who was a corrections officer in South Dakota, uh, saying, I need some money for a motel. And so the mom kind of set them up to be busted before they got themselves killed. So um, then um, they bring these kids in, and I've got a little, little clip here where I'll show you. They get interviewed first by the local authorities, Baton Rouge. And uh, the clip you're going to see is uh, Sergeant Ben Odom, who is no telling how many dead bodies he stepped over and bar fights and everything else. To, he's talking to Rod. And you can kind of, one of the interesting things is you kind of, you can hear and see how the police interview people. You know, uh, it's not like TV. Uh, TV, you know, they, they say, look, we got you. Here's the proof, you know, and the guy confesses over in 15 minutes, right? Uh-uh. This goes on for hours. But Rod is this very odd character. He's like bragging or saying how tough he is 
or uh, all this kind of nonsense, okay? Um, so he's, and he's saying, well, it's my, I, my doings. Everybody else is just an accessory, especially my girlfriend, Charity, uh, 15 years old. She's pregnant um, by me. And there's another girl, she's 19, Dana Cooper. She's Charity's friend. And there's another kid that owned the car. His name is Howard Scott Anderson, 17. And uh, Howard is from a, well, I have to say dysfunctional, can't even begin to talk about it. Murray, Kentucky, uh, well, in that area, bitterly cold at winter time. Um, there's, they're putting uh, garbage bags on the windows to keep the wind out. Um, it's alcoholism, um, drug abuse, uh, domestic violence, um, child neglect, child abandonment, you name it. And one of the social workers says, um, it won't be long before there'll be some t terrible disaster. And they were right. So that's the group we're talking about. And uh, this is the interesting thing too. I talk in this book about cults. And there's a lot of, when the kids are arrested in, uh, when the kids are arrested in Louisiana, one of the uh, this court system uh, appoints some lawyers to represent the kids. And one of the lawyers says, this is not the Charles Manson case. And that's true, because no telling how many people those people killed, besides the ones we know about, which is awful. But there are similarities. And I talk about that in the book. They First of all, in a cult, they give you a different name, a different identity. They isolate you from your parents and from everybody else in your family. Um, and they keep preaching the same message, whatever that message is, over and over again. Of course, Rod is into the occult. He actually conjures up demons or tries to. They're into this black magic thing and all this jazz. He studies um, all these books, uh, psychology and black magic books, to try to, dis quote unquote, destroy people's minds. He says if you control them, that's, then you're winning, okay? That's who this guy is. This kid is 16 years old. So what kind of kid at 16 years old, where did he come from? Okay, this is his deal. His father is no longer around. His mother is a complete whack job. She, um, she gets into vampirism herself. Um, she claims that she's raped during a, a vampire um, orgy by a rival cult leader. She thinks there's a demon hovering around her bedroom. She's a bedroom window. She's on the second floor of an apartment building. Um, she can't have any kind of stable relationship whatsoever. So a lot of times she lives with her parents. Um, nice blue collar people. And, but she refuses to allow them to have any um, contact with, um, or any discipline, I should say. No discipline. Actually, it took him like 20 fucking minutes to stop, I swear. I thought he was a war the hard to What'd you hit him with? A crowbar. You need some shit or chains on those two messy. Just nasty. Some of the bark's pretty messy, too, you know. Oh, we got a little blood spot on me. Surprising. Yeah. Alright. But anyway, so after that I basically picked his body up and screwed him around to look for his wallet and stuff. That's where we found his discovery card. Alright. And about two minutes after I flipped him back over where he was, her mother came out of the shower. Nice hot cup of coffee that she spilled all over me. Because she asked me, what did I want? Because she thought I was just robbing them. She hadn't seen her husband yet? No, 
No, I made sure that he was hidden. Okay. I didn't want her to freak. <clears throat> so she didn't know. Uh, like I said, she just basically just looked straight at me and said, what do you want? By that time, you know, it was pretty obvious I had blood on me and a crowbar in my hand. <laughs> I was fixing to say, yeah, I want to have coffee with you. She lunged at me. You know, I was actually going to let her live. But after she lunged at me, I just took the bottom of the crowbar and kept stabbing into her skull. And whenever she fell down, I just continually beat her until I saw her brains falling on the floor. Because that pissed me off. That's how I got these. She scratched you. She clawed me, clawed me, spilled a fucking scalding hot coffee on me. Pissed me off. So I made sure she was dead. Rummaged through the house looking for car keys, money, whatever. Thought about waiting for Zoe's sister, but then decided, nah, why bother? Gotta come home, have a mental breakdown, call the police. Which I was correct. She did. Anyway, went through the parents' bedroom and found the keys to the Explorer, which even now impounded. Casually walked outside afterwards, unlocked the door, and peeled out of the driveway. Where was Scott during all this time? Following behind me, totally froze. <coughs> He's never seen anyone get killed before. Because he was all hyped about it, telling me how he was going to kill one. So basically, he's just an accessory. Okay. That we drove over to Janine's house looking for the girls because they thought we were only getting the girls to run away with us, which was very far from our mind at that point in time because I didn't want to be followed. So we drove back over to Janine's house. At that point in time, when we drove an explorer, so we kind of realized what happened to her parents. She flipped for about. Hundred miles or so. Yeah, they're dead. Yeah. Okay. She goes by the side. Okay. See any remorse there? It's cold, isn't it? Now the defense attorneys, before we a uh, reporter saw this thing, we had to fight for everything. Like I said, we redacted. Um, text of the confession and all it was was it was all black like this thing here it was like every line was blacked out <laughs> you know it was terrible and um so but when they played this thing in the courtroom the judge allowed it to be played the jury turned and looked at him like oh my god what am i looking at who is this person? Because here he is. He's got a haircut. Now, he had really long hair, flowing hair. You know, so, you know, in the courtroom, they, they clean him up. They give him a haircut, a nice bow tie, and a white shirt or whatever. And they gave him crayons to color with, like he's just a child, you know, sympathy. But the game was up when they saw that. Um so then they talked with the girlfriend, Charity, and he says, by the way, he was willing to talk all about it. He says, if you just give me a chance to be alone with Charity after this for a few minutes. The cop says, sure, no, no problem. Although they recorded it. They didn't know they were being watched. But um, so then they, of course, they, um, Scott, they talk with Dana, Cooper, the 19-year-old, they talk with, of course they talked. By this time, the, the Lake County uh, detectives were on their way to Kentucky when they got the call that the kids had been arrested in Baton Rouge. So they just made a left turn in Atlanta. So, um, so they were anxious to talk with Heather. And Heather says, I didn't know my parents were going to be harmed. And 
She says, I didn't know. And then it more, it more came out like, I told him not to do it. I told him not to hurt my parents. These other kids said on the way down from Kentucky, Rod kept saying, I want to kill somebody. I want to kill something. I want to kill somebody. Over and over and over again. So um, it, was a, it was a perfect storm. Um, but she says, I didn't know. Well, it turns out later, she'd been racking up hundreds and hundreds of dollars in long-distance phone bills. Remember those? <laughs> anyway, uh, with this guy and with um, Janine LeClaire. And Janine, this is the interesting thing, too. Talk about spiritual warfare. Janine's parents were members of a church. She was in a church youth group. Um, and they discovered some of these letters and this kind of thing. And, uh, and they said, this is, this is not who we are. You know, this is not us. And so they forbid uh, her to um, uh, see him anymore, talk with him, or send him letters or anything else. This is something else that Rod said during this interview. At the end of the interview, because the Lake County cops got a chance to talk with him too. He says, to feel that fact that I was taking a life, because it's just like the old philosophy about if you can take a life, you become a god for a split second. And it kind of actually felt that way for a minute. Then he says, but if I was a god, I wouldn't exactly be here, would I? I mean, it, this is why this story is, you read it and you go like, is this for real? This, can people really be this twisted? Um, and yes, they can. Because what he did, as opposed to Janine's, I mean, uh, yeah, Janine's parents, the Wendors, very nice people, but I think they were just a little bit naive about the threat. You know, they didn't realize how much danger they were in, and they, they couldn't have imagined what was going to happen. And um, so they, on the night that um, this murder took place, Janine was supposed to leave with this group. And she snuck out her window, and at first they came by and says, um, she says, I can't leave yet because they're still awake, my parents. Then later she sneaks out the window, but she misses her ride. Her mother goes into her daughter's bedroom later, realizes she's missing, gets in the car and drives down the road and she said, I just had a feeling. And she saw the family's puppy. She stopped and picked the puppy up in the driveway, put it in the car, and the puppy was crying and carrying on. So she says, okay, I'm, I'm gonna go back to the house. She goes back to the house, parks the car, and stands and looks at woods across the street, dark. And she says, I just had a feeling. And then Janine steps out from the woods and they talk. And that's when Suzanne went to go tell the, warn the wind or so it was too late. So there's a, there's a spirit world out there. It's evil and then there's good. So that's, and Rod spent his entire life trying to conjure up demons and worship the devil and all this other kind of stuff. Um, all right. I don't want to go on too long. I want to open this up for questions here in a few minutes. Um, so we get to the, uh, the trial stage or the beginning of the trial stage. And like I say, we, we had to fight for everything. And one of the defense attorneys, um, well, first of all, they bring them back eventually from Baton Rouge. They have all these hearings. They bring them back. Um, and then I sent a, a letter to Rod in the jail. I said, Rod, let's talk. So he called as soon as I left the office, of course. So two other reporters got the interview. But um, he says, um, 
you know, I have these special blackout moments, and I have multiple personalities, and I don't remember this stuff. And uh, then he blames his rival gang and all this sort of thing. And, and uh, Bill Gross says, well, I don't care which personality uh, it, we have, we got them locked up, you know, in the jail. So um, it was all a bunch of crazy stuff anyway, uh, lies and so on. So there's an indictment of the four kids from Kentucky, but not Heather. And the sheriff at that time, Sheriff Knup, he's like, okay, why not Heather? And the state attorney, Brad King, at that time says, don't worry, well, this is part of the process. So they, they, they call another grand jury, and Heather testifies before the grand jury and says, I didn't know my parents were going to be harmed. So the grand jury cuts her loose. Now, in the state of Florida, to be charged as a principal, you have to have an active role in the crime. So um, they said, no, you don't have a, she didn't have an active role. She didn't plan it. She didn't know her parents were harmed and so on. So then the defense attorneys freak it out. Um, one of an, uh, Rod's attorney in particular starts doing all these motions like we should have closed hearings. We should have no news coverage. We should, like, the, even the trial should be, you know, no coverage. And, of course, the editorial board just flipped out. They said, this is America, not North Korea, you know. Are you crazy? We have to do these things in the open. So um, we had to fight and scrap for everything. Uh, and we were all subpoenaed. I, I got subpoenaed a lot. I interviewed people in the jail. So I could have covered my walls with the subpoenas like <laughs> sometimes. Um, but we had this wonderful lawyer who always got us out of jams like that, actually. So, um, but it was, a, it was a fight. And I understand uh, there was uh, all this massive publicity. So when they had the trial, the trial finally comes, the entire courthouse has got big, huge bundles of wire going through. They had set aside an empty courtroom for a press center. There's TV crews there. There's film crews there. There's the Associated Press there. There's different papers there. Um, it was, uh, but the judge, uh, Judge Lockett, had everything under control. Um, no, no problems. So. Um, but the trial itself was interesting because one of the things that came out was Rod's mentor. They called him the Prince of the City after some vampire game. His name was Jaden Murphy. And um, he was a vampire. But he says, it's a lifestyle. He says, look, I don't have fangs. And he opens his mouth to the cameras and shows that he doesn't have fangs in the trial. And Sonder testifies and says, I love Jaden. Jaden is about a year older than Rod was. So that was interesting. She'd sent him a um, Valentine's Day card. Um, so it was, it was very interesting. But the, there was also, it was a parade of psychologists. Well, he has got this personality disorder or that personality disorder. And basically, they put Sandra, uh, the mother, on trial because, you know, she was so crazy and such a terrible mother. Then, you know, that's why he did what he did. And what he did was Rod pleaded guilty right away, thinking uh, there's two phases. Uh, they were going to charge him with the death penalty. So there's two phases, the guilt phase and the penalty phase. So he pleads guilty and the first phase, thinking that the state will drop the death penalty thing. They didn't. So then they have the trial, and they show the clips, and they have the medical examiner comes with all the pictures. She has these models to show how each person was, Richard Windorf and Ruth Queen were hit in the head about 20 times each. Um, you know, it was just, uh, 
horrific thing. And um, one of the witnesses that didn't testify was Heather. She was nowhere to be found. And everybody wanted to hear from Heather, of course, but the prosecutor's no dummy. Because he, he, if you put her on the stand, then everybody's going to be looking at her like, why, why isn't she in trouble instead of Rod? And the prosecutor was smart, says, let's focus on the killer here. So that was interesting. But after the trial, Judge Lockett says, you know, we still don't know a lot about Heather. I think we should have another grand jury. <laughs> so so uh, they have another grand jury and another, um, no, she didn't do it kind of thing. Um, but, you know, the psychologist, and they do a good job. Um, one of them described his uh, mental condition as fantasy world rage. Built up rage because, you know, as a parent, I mean, as a child, you want discipline. A parent to be a parent. And she tried to be his friend and all that sort of thing. So, um, anyway. Um, and then, um, so he gets sentenced to death. That gets overturned. The Florida Supreme Court says, no, he's too young. He was too young when he committed the crime. But then there's a whole bunch of appeals and on and on and on. And it goes on and goes on. In 2019, it comes back for resentencing because the Supreme Court says, you know, juveniles are a special case. They need to have another shot, you know, all this kind of thing. The Supreme Court, by the way, keeps moving the ball. Just keep moving the ball. And I won't, I won't spoil the ending for you. I won't tell you how that turned out. 